Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Um, and thanks Nikki and Laura for being here with me to chat about everything you're doing to combat fraud. Um, fraud is obviously a huge topic. I don't know how many of you raised your hands when asked um, who here got scammed, but I'm sure if you haven't been scammed before, you probably know someone who has. Um, and I know myself as the, the FinTech correspondent at the FT, I spent about a third of my time writing about fraud and payment fraud in particular, um, and what it, it costs for banks. Um, but before we dive into what you're doing, the solutions to, to combat payment fraud, um, I think it would be good to kind of get a sense of the scale of this problem. Um, so what is the cost um, of fraud firstly for consumers? Um, who, who is getting scammed and what's the impact? Um, Laura, do you want to start? Sure, I mean, I, I, like you said, I don't know how many of you raised your hands, but I think it's anecdotally, I'll say just for myself, it's something that I've seen in the last year, two years, grow exponentially, um, including people that I'm close to, including people who I never thought would be sort of victims of scams. If you think you have a sort of a certain level of sophistication, I think you, you Im imagine yourself to be immune from it, but the sophistication of the scammers has gotten so great that I think we've now kind of all probably been, you know, victim in some way or another or going to be soon. Um, it's the numbers of, of kind of post-pandemic fraud in particular are staggering um, in the United States and in Europe. And so I think it's just growing at a, a huge rate with APP fraud being um, one of the top sort of fraud problems that we've seen in our, in Alloy's 2024 fraud report, it was sort of the, the top concern. Mm -hmm. Nikki, do you want to add a kind of UK perspective on, on the impact of fraud? Um, yeah, I mean, just to add some numbers to what Laura yeah. was saying, um, I think what we see in the UK is about half a billion pounds of consumer losses are reported. Um, probably much bigger amount than that because people don't necessarily love report being scammed and it's a hugely um, humiliating personal experience. Um, I think in the US the numbers are like $10 billion of losses reported to the SEC. Um, and obviously, you know, the problem, the problem is global. So the UK in some ways um, is seen as a scam capital uh, because because English is the lingua franca, but because also the UK was the first in rolling out real-time payments uh, in 2008. Um, but, uh, so, so we see a lot of the scam dynamics firsthand, but certainly other geographies are, are also catching up in, in the worst way. And aside from the kind of obvious horrible impact on consumers, how is this problem impacting financial services and how are banks thinking about this? What's the cost for them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um, so the UK is unique in terms of the cost for it in that earlier this year, so about uh, six weeks ago, a new law was passed or was enacted effectively where banks are now liable for scam losses. So that half a billion pounds that I mentioned is now shifting onto banks' P&Ls. And so there's a very clear sort of liability and loss there. Um, that said, there are other countries, and, and again, Laura probably knows this better than I do, but other regimes where there are some sort of voluntary liabilities being repaid. Um, there's considerations in PSD3 um, for at least bank impersonation being, um, being a, a, a loss that, um, that banks are liable for. So that's one big cost category. But I would actually argue that the focus on just the liability, which is a lot of what gets discussed these days, is, is sometimes a little narrow-minded. Like Banks also end up paying for this, and what we see with some of our customers is actually the operational challenge of scams, the investigation, the trying to break the spell, the trying to claw back the funds, sometimes, you know, overshadowing the actual liability at a three to one ratio. And, and that's not even to, to speak about customer experience and churn when, when your customer gets scammed. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on that, um, aside from the UK, I guess, abroad? Um, yeah, the US is different in that we don't have the same, we've not, we've not had the same um, kind of burden that that the UK has now adopted. A lot of folks in the US are talking about that potentially coming. coming. I, we're always like five or 10 years behind the UK in everything we do in financial services. So maybe someday we'll get there. Um, at a minimum, what we're seeing though is US financial institutions starting to talk about it. In certain cases, starting to reimburse their customers. Um, Zelle has been one of the ones where there's been headlines about that. They will proactively reimburse customers in some cases, presumably for, for kind of reputational risk. Um, and there's been a lot of talk with uh, legislators in the United States about whether they sh there should be something more like what they've done in the UK. I think with the new administration coming in, that might change, I, it, you know, TBD, but I think there's, there's a, a huge sort of sea change at a minimum from a reputation perspective and sort of a, 
uh, brand perspective of these banks who have taken a real, very much a hands-off, like this is not our problem approach and starting to change that. Uh, anecdotally, I spend time with some of our US banking clients who think a lot about this and really want to help their customers because it's a huge cost to their customers. It's a huge operational burden for them to have to triage all these cases, figure out what to do. And they're trying to implement in their call centers, for example, which is one of the primary vectors where this happens, um, any, anywhere where kind of social engineering is happening, um, they're trying to implement workflows and beta test and kind of do these, these almost, you know, experiments, human behavior experiments in their call centers to figure out how can they, they can break the spell. Um, and so that's just an enormous undertaking that they're primarily doing on their own right now. Each, each bank is just trying to have to figure this out. Like, how do I tell this customer that they're being scammed? It's really hard. Um, and Laura, you said earlier Ford is getting increasingly sophisticated. Yeah. Um, obviously, I mean, we all, all know here about um, Gen AI and how has that changed the game for criminals, um, have they already sort of used this technology to, uh, you know, put forward on steroids, or has that not happened yet? Are you seeing anything specific? Like, can you give us the kind of state of play on, on that, both of you? Yeah, I think Gen AI has been largely uh, a boon to fraudsters. So there are obviously ways you can deploy it to mitigate fraud, to fight fraud. Uh, but if you are hamstrung by the compliance and, and legal system in the United States, which, we, which financial institutions very much are, there's limited ways you can actually use Gen AI to your advantage. Um, although I hope Nikki can prove me wrong, and I, I know that Tunic is, is one of the companies that's working on it, but there is, it, the sophistication of these fraudsters and the ability, they don't have to abide by the law, they are not ab abiding by the law. Um, they can create deep fakes very easily now. Um, both visual and audio, so it's happening on you know calls of, of all kinds, um, and I think it's just it's a problem that isn't we have not yet figured out how to meet, you know, with the right uh, technologies. I will say I think the layered approach of bringing in all the data you can possibly find, so biometrics data, um, you know, fr fraud data of all types, uh, account takeover, anything that you can get your hands on now helps you because the old ways of doing identity checks and fraud checks at onboarding no longer work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would also say that, I mean, definitely deep fakes, and we saw that with like a horrendous loss. I think it was $50 million in Hong Kong recently. You know, it's, yeah, a it's single, terrifying. Yeah, in a single moment. In a single transaction, a yeah. single moment um, yeah. is, is very real. And, and also the dynamic of, you know, I think we have a lot of stereotypes, um, and no one deserves uh, to be scammed, but we have a lot of stereotypes. It's, you know, the grandmother who doesn't know how to use a mobile phone who gets scammed. The reality is, is like, with AI, we are all vulnerable. And, you know, some of our customers who are sophisticated heads of fraud and heads of risk have, you know, their own stories about how this happens. So I think, you know, we're entering a world where more people are vulnerable. And then I also think that, you know, for all the conversation about deep fakes, that's very scary. And it does happen. It does happen for high value transactions. But Gen AI is just a, an amazing CRM to run loads of campaigns to loads of people at scale. Um, no longer are you getting the email riddled with typos, et cetera. I'm getting something very convincing that sounds like it's from, you know, every knows about my mother, it has her tone of voice in an email, et cetera. I think, um, yeah, there is a, there's a massive asymmetry in terms of the bazooka that we have handed fraudsters um, compared to the defenses that the financial system has. Yeah. And you said earlier that uh, one of the reasons why the UK is like the fraud capital of the world is that, you know, everyone speaks English and it's very easy to kind of target people from anywhere because people speak English. Um, do you think that with AI tools and translation tools, we'll kind of see uh, fraud spread more globally? Um, is that something we're seeing already? Yeah, for sure. Although there are so many variables that, you know, I think AI drives the increase in scams. I think another reason that scams are going up is frankly because like a lot of fraud companies have done an amazing job at protecting from the classic types of fraud, which is someone steals your identity, someone steals your card details and makes a transaction on your behalf. And so, you know, what fraud companies have done in the last 10, 20 years has made it um, really Easy, not easy, but really improve the defenses that banks have in terms of detecting is Akila who she says she is when she's making this transaction. But if Akila is socially engineered to send money to Nikki, who's a money mule or a fraudster, there is almost nothing that they can do. And so it's, it's kind of the, a response to some of the defenses that have built, been built up. 
And then I, I also think um, it's a response to the fact that um, mostly money now moves instantly and irreversibly. And that is amazing. That is amazing for consumers. It's amazing for economic activity. It's amazing for financial inclusion. But it also means that another defense, which is you know, slowing things down, taking time, um, having disputes or chargebacks is, is now sort of waning as a solution. And that's, that is the solution in the United States today. It's like if you talk about real-time payments, most financial institutions' solution to fraud is friction or adding time and just like holding a payment for three days. Which, which I think is really cynical, frankly. Like yeah. I, we've had some of that conversation in the UK now where um, and with the advent of the new law, the, there was an extension in the window that a payment can be investigated. It used to be 24 hours, it's now four days. I think you've reported yeah. on that, so you probably know more about it than I do. But um, first of all, thankfully, we're not seeing that be a reality because that would be horrendous for consumers. Having your payment held for four, four days, days yeah. in 2024, are you kidding me? Um, but, but secondly, I also think it's a, it's a cynical response to say that um, with the amount of like, technology and sophistication we have today, um, that we would reverse all the progress that fintech has made in the last yeah. 20 years and go backwards to like really slow, uh, expensive systems. Yeah. So let's get into the solutions that you're each sort of building. And obviously, it's, this whole thing is a cat and mouse game, isn't it? So obviously, scammers are using tech and all the tools they have to scam people. Um, but what are you guys doing? What are you building? How are you using technology? And this is your, your chance to pitch your companies. <laughs> Uh, sure. So Alloy solves the identity risk problem for financial institutions, both banks and fintech companies. We serve about 650 clients globally, um, and that ranges from early stage fintech companies to you know top banks in the United States and, and the UK. Um, we our sort of value proposition is that there's this inherent tension between doing business, so onboarding customers, letting them transact, letting them transact easily and without, with minimal friction, um, and then staying safe from compliance and from fraud challenges. And that's a really tough place to be in 2024 when the consumer demand is for instant, frictionless, easy, on your mobile phone, wanting to do something really um, quickly. And so what we do is we bring a, a, an orchestration platform that brings a whole bunch of data sources together in one single API. And that means that we can look at sort of your holistic identity from all different places. We can look at your social media profiles. We can look at your um, public records databases. We can look at your, the way that you type we can look at uh, your fingerprints, all sorts of stuff, and say, yes, we think this is actually you onboarding or doing this transaction. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the, the place, that, the role we play. Yeah, and, and that, I think that responsiveness, I mean, obviously, <laughs> that responsiveness is so important in the fraud world where like typologies and patterns in, of attack are constantly changing. Um, for us at Tunic Pay, we're, we're entirely focused on scams and on APP fraud. Um, so that is our bread and butter. What we deliver to banks is payment intelligence, effectively enabling them to understand the context of a transaction. Um, you know, is Aquila buying, investing in a crazy crypto scheme that, not all crypto is bad, but you know, is she investing in a scheme that actually is an investment scam, understanding what's happening and then also understanding the counterparty, the, the account that the bank doesn't have visibility into, whether that's you know, a money mule or a fraudster on the other side, because that is sort of the, the unique challenge of scams, is needing to understand more about the context and the counterparty. Um, we work with a range of uh, tier one banks and neo banks, um, and so if anyone in the audience here is looking for a uh, fraud solution uh, specifically on scams, please do come find us. And, and I guess, why is this problem so hard to solve why do you think existing solutions have kind of failed to combat fraud? Because, you know, it, I mean, it keeps rising. Um, and why haven't seen a sort of clear market winner, you know, emerge and, you know, yeah. Well, well I'll give the dumb answer, which is like, I think what Nikki just alluded to. No one was, we, we've all been looking at the identity of the person making the transaction. And so in a, in a pre-APP fraud world, you know, or in much of the fraud that we've dealt with in the last 10 years or five years, it's bad actors, right? I can look, like I'm a, you, you can figure out these signals about me that I'm a nefarious person doing this bad stuff. Uh, with APP fraud, it's different because it's Nikki, lovely person that she is, well-intentioned, um, being scammed. And so, no one was looking at where the money is going, and that's what Tunic is doing, which is sort of unique in the market. No one else seems to be doing that, which is where, what's the account that it's going to? Presumably that account 
is doing this all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, scam these scammers are not usually just picking on Nikki. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for both calling me a scammer and pitching my product. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on why existing solutions have failed to solve this, this problem before? I mean, I think it's a mix of, um, yeah, definitely. I think like fraud patterns and paradigms have been different. Historically, they have been fa focused on attacking the sender um, and not um, on stealing the sender's identity, not, um, not socially engineering them, which is just a very different um, dynamic. I think also, you know, we just have to recognize that the world is changing. We lead more digital lives. We transact with people online. Um, we, the payment system Faster has payments, changed. Faster payments, yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, it is, it is a trend, you know, it is a reality, a problem of our time, I think, existentially, is like, what is reality and what isn't in the digital world that we live in? Um, and that applies to financial services just as it does to every single other industry. And so, um, certainly, I hope Tunic Pay will be the category winner in this space, but I think there will be lots of amazing teams and lots of different parts of the solution that are needed, all the way from, you know, up the value chain at the very top, um, at the origination, whether that's sort of, you know, detection solutions um, or, or sort of... Um, consumer protection solutions uh, within social media all the way down to the payment and the clawback and the, and the claims processes. And so, um, you know, I think hopefully we have some other founders and aspiring founders in the room. Um, there are a lot, there's lots to be done in terms of preventing scams. And I think we're certainly all looking for more collaborators um, because it will take a village. We also had this sort of confluence of like rise of Gen AI and, deep, and the ability of deep fakes I mean, that, that, didn't, that wasn't a thing two years ago. Yeah. Along with the rise of fraud, which is sort of a related but separate, a largely post-pandemic thing that happened. And so those two things colliding sort of like rocked our world, yeah. I think. Um, and so I guess from the bank's perspective or the payment company's perspective, um, you know, can you kind of walk me through the major pain points and, you know, blind spots they have in terms of the information they have on their customers and or scammers. Um, like on that whole journey from onboarding a customer to allowing a payment to go through, like where, where are the biggest problems that need to be solved or the pain points? And yeah. maybe for, for different payment routes as well. I can start on onboarding. So yeah. user onboards. Um, you know, first and foremost, you're just checking, is this who they say they are? Is this person on a, a money laundering list of some kind, a terrorist watch list? You might be looking at some uh, behavioral biometrics type of data as they um, fill in information about themselves. There's a host of different places you can look for that data, public records, like I said, all, so all sorts of um, consortium, right? So someone can, can flag this device is sort of like a known bad actor device. This IP address is a bot, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so you, that's where you kind of go through that first gauntlet. I would say where it gets really challenging is that many financial institutions separate their onboarding systems and data. So sort of like your, your identity record is separated from onboarding from what you do post onboarding. So sort of once you're in the door, you're treated, everyone's treated the same. Um, and that's a challenge because people have flying colors, everything looks good, you know, green lights all around. That should be treated differently from someone who um, got onboarded, they passed, but there were, you know, their, their email address was fewer than 30 days old, like a real risk signal like that. And so you have these systems that can't really distinguish sort of, you know, green, green all, all looks good from kind of yellow, some yellow flags from red. Um, and that, that's a really big challenge. And then also pulling in the data just to marry the onboarding profile from, you know, so the Laura who onboarded from the Laura who took money out of the ATN sometimes, those profiles don't kind of meet up and get updated. And so what you should be doing is being able to say, like, you know, I took money out of the ATM 10 times in a row. That's a really, I let you do it, but it's a really risky activity that should be sort of updated in my profile. But that concept doesn't exist in many financial institutions. And so I think that's part of the value chain. Yeah, value. I couldn't agree more. I think um, that we are moving from a world of just like, are you a known bad actor? 
um, to a probabilistic determination of yeah. what, is, what is your behavior around that life cycle. And I think why that's so important is that um, you know, fraudsters will move through bad accounts like burner phones. By the time like the money, by the time someone's investigated a claim, reported it into a bad actor database, like it's, the money's gone, the person's gone, it's too late. They've opened like 15 other accounts. Um, and so, you know, kind of having that probabilistic view along the journey is really important. And my background is actually, prior to building Tunic Pay, I actually built a credit bureau. Um, I just really love selling data to banks. But, you know, in the credit reporting world, we've had this shift from negative only reporting to positive reporting. You report someone's financial behavior as they are building a credit profile. You report their repayment behavior, and so you separate good actors, bad actors, and you make these kind of score-based decisions along the way. And I think the fraud world is starting to catch up with that, but yeah. hasn't historically. And then the second thing that I'll say that I think is a problem for financial institutions is that even as they move into these probabilistic determinations, because they often don't have enough data, either on their own customer, and to my point, you know, the other side of the transaction, the counterparty or the payment context, the rate of false positives is horrendous. And so when we are all making payments today and we get like 15 warning screens of, are you sure you're sure? And do you really want to go forward with this? And now call the, pay the call center and get the payment process and all these sorts of things. Like, that is an expensive and anti-consumer financial outcome, expensive for the bank, and erodes trust in the financial system in the long run. And so kind of figuring out how to navigate those false positives, I, th I think, is kind of the, the corollary of the, of the probabilistic world we're entering. Um, and in terms of policy, there's been a, a big debate in the UK, as you know, and I think you know, it's starting elsewhere as well. Um, but it's really focused on liability, and I guess everyone's just been debating, everyone agrees in the UK that consumers should be refunded for fraud losses. Um, and the debate now is whether banks should kind of shoulder all of the cost or if big tech, um, so companies like Meta, have a role to play because a lot of um, payment scams actually originate on their platforms. Um, where do you stand on that? And do you think uh, anything is missing from, from that debate? I don't know that I have uh, enough experience to answer whether they should participate in this. And I think we're all new. We're, we're all kind of figuring this out. Like I said, this this confluence of factors that made this a, one of the biggest problems we have right now is very recent. It's just happened really quickly, and so I don't know that I don't know that we have the answers yet about where where who should be responsible, how we even mitigate it. In a practical sense, even if we were to all agree in this room, like, yes, they should, how do you adjudicate that? How do you determine in what cases? And, and banks are, are facing this too, by the way. It's not just with these big platforms, but how do you determine uh, at what level the sophistication of that scam was that, like, that yes, they should, in fact, mm. bear the burden? I think it's really tough to say um, from a kind of purely pragmatic perspective that it's reasonable and effective. I mean, I, I would say there's been, yeah, in some ways, a liability is a good incentive uh, to engage in solutions, but in many ways, it's also a bit of a distraction. Like, we spend so much time fighting around who's liable, trying to find ways to shift the liability yeah. either onto the consumer or onto another platform, debating things like consumer standards of caution and things like that, that, that ends up being a distraction from actually preventing the fraud from happening, which should be uh, where the efforts are. And I want to be clear that even if a consumer is reimbursed for the loss, Firstly, it's a horrendous experience for the consumer. But secondly, that is still billions of pounds going to organized crime around the world. Sometimes, you know, both from the, fr both from the consumer loss and from the bank's reimbursement. So we've sort of doubled the, the problem. So I, I, I do think at the policy level, um, there is more and more ambition that could be brought to the actual prevention challenge, not just the liability. To the piece on, like, social media being liable. I mean, yeah, you, you, you mentioned it. The, the stats we see are, um, I think UK Finance did a study which was 70% of um, APP fraud in particular, which I guess is a subtype of scams, originates um, on social media platforms. Um, and then, you know, I think it's like 15% on telcos and the rest is um, other dynamics. We did a study at, at Tunic Pay, which was, we found that, you know, 70% of consumers actually support the um, 
uh, social media companies being liable because there is, you know, they see them sort of feeding them these ads, these algorithms and saying like, you know, I, I use your platform, I want some protection from you. So there is certainly like pressure and demand there. I think, I think we're heartened. I think NatWest recently did some work uh, with Meta um, around building um, effectively a reinforcing um, the Meta models based on NatWest post claims data. Uh, but it's really the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that can be done there. And yes, there are certainly problems around like attribution and adjudication, but I would love to see, rather than focusing on who's liable, I'd love to see like a data, a real profound data collaboration, That's uh, which is one big part. Like the pressure yeah. to do that feels productive, which is we should all yeah. be figuring out how we should share data, but share it in the real time. Yeah, not after the fact, not just yeah. at the claims level and not just training someone's algorithm, focusing on actually enabling the banks to stop the, because yeah. they are where the payment happens at the end of the day, stop that payment from happening. And why is that so hard to do? Because it seems like everyone wants that, and it sounds like the obvious solution to triangulate information between all the sectors, but what are the challenges that come with that? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, we enable banks to share data, but I would say banks have not shared enough data amongst themselves even, so we first need to like, clean up our own industry and then, and then talk about the cross-industry piece. Um, you're right, like, the data sharing conversation has probably existed, at least in the UK, for eight years now. Um, the payment system operator developed specs around data sharing. There's been a lot of efforts around it. I think, you know, data sharing runs into issues of both privacy, um, how do we protect consumers' data, and also competition. You know, HSBC doesn't want NatWest knowing their customer's mortgage is going up for renewal. I, as NatWest customer, don't want, you know, Facebook to suddenly start serving me a bunch of mortgage ads without my permission. And so there are a lot of real challenges around it. But what I would say is that, like, we live in a technological age where those things are not really relevant challenges anymore. Like where encryption is today and where the possibilities of data federation exist means that we can exchange data securely without exposing um, these challenges anymore. So I'm actually very, very optimistic and excited about, I think, what even we'll see in the next two years around data sharing. There's also challenges, I think, from a data sharing perspective of, again, these kind of silos that exist and how, yeah. do you, how do you just sort of operationally make it, even if we all agree and it's private and whatever, encrypted, just the challenge of sending in and out data from various very old, in the United States, banking systems is... is That's so true. I focused on the kind of like theoretically um, sexy challenges, but yeah, what we've found is actually just like getting... Bank, two banks to exchange data means them exposing a bunch of data sets. If you've, and if you've grown through M&A, like like that's a really challenging yeah. thing. Like even yeah. saying like two banks are going to exchange the date of account opening, let's say, um, that is challenging because it actually gets calculated differently in different banks. They have different systems. And so, yeah, we found, for all that I talk about, our sort of federated data architecture, probably more of our work is around just like data ETL cleanup, data standardization. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. and is there anything on the policy side that could kind of help to take this or what do you think? Are you expecting anything? I don't think so. I'd be curious if you think differently. I mean, like, fraud is a legitimate interest under GDPR. The, the regulations are clear. I don't think banks would, or anyone, would think that having a centrally mandated spec for data sharing when we need flexibility to different systems, to different fraud patterns and typologies would be the right solution. So um, I don't think necessarily I would think at a spec level we want to do an open banking 2.0 around fraud data sharing, but I do think there could be incentives around it. And so, you know, I think about, I contrast the world of scams in real-time payments versus the world of scams in cards. Both of them have scams, but the rates are much lower in cards, in part because cards have figured out ways to exchange data on the network around a transaction, and 3D secure, secure customer authentication is a mechanism whereby you shift liability in exchange for data. You could do the same thing in real-time payments, and that would be a huge protection. Um, and then final question, I guess a topical one, um, but a lot of these policies are driven by consumer protection incentives from governments. Um, and obviously in the US, do you think it's fair to say that the focus in the next four years uh, after the election will kind of be Spicy. less on consumer protection? And how is that going to change the space that you both work in? Um, what do you think? We were having this conversation on the way over here. Um, <laughs> the president-elect of the United States is unpredictable, to say the least. So I, I think it's all, it's, we don't really know. Um, I do think we've seen in his previous administration that consumer protection when it comes to financial services is not a priority. Um, and dismantling CFAB and other, other consumer protection mechanisms we have in the United States was certainly 
um, something he did in, in, starting in 2016. And so I don't know that we should expect something totally different. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, but I, I think we, sh we w I would not put a lot of faith in uh, like the CFPB and the consumer protection mechanisms we do have in the United States to be able to continue that work going forward. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that from watching it from the UK, Nikki? Um, I mean, I, th I th you know, when we look at different geographies, we do see different approaches to the consumer financial protection. So Australia is also making banks, but also telcos and social media liable for scams. Singapore has similar regulation. PSD3 in Europe does shift some of that liability. And so um, I think the movement around liability is possibly a global one, and I don't know what will happen um, specifically in the US. But again, I think to Laura's earlier point, we are seeing banks self-organize around some of yeah. this because the essence of the financial system is trust. And if you have payment rails that fail people where they lose their money to horrific scams, like the financial system Or consumer breaks. friction where then they yeah. just can't do Make business. Make payments. It's bad yeah. for everyone. Um, great. Well, thanks both for all these insights. It's been great chatting with you. And thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.